When I was 13, I thought I had discovered the most incredible diet. The more I ate, the more weight I lost. But this diet came with some really unusual side effects. I was constantly tired. I was always thirsty. Eventually, my mom took me to see the doctor. And this is where we got the bad news. I'm sorry, you have to go to the hospital immediately to begin treatment. You have diabetes. My first day at Children's Hospital, they taught me how to inject myself with insulin. But frankly, I didn't mind. I was actually a bit of a science nerd, and I liked getting to play doctor. The second day, they taught me how to count the number of carbohydrates in my food. But again, I'm good at math. This is going to be totally manageable. But on the third day, reality sunk in. They explained how difficult this disease is to manage, how expensive my supplies would be, and that there's no cure. I remember sitting in my hospital bed, feeling shattered. How was I going to manage this? How is my family going to afford this? What did I do to deserve this? I quickly became ashamed of my condition because I felt so different, and I hid it best I could into my 20s. But if it did come up for some reason, I made sure to clarify that I had the genetic type of diabetes, not that type you get from being fat and lazy. But this was wrong. And I was simply passing on my shame to other undeserving individuals. Shame is the diabetes complication we need to talk about. And today I'm going to walk you through what diabetes is, why it's so difficult to manage, and why we need to change the conversation. One in 11 Americans have some form of diabetes. But what exactly is this condition? At its core, diabetes means that your body has difficulty turning carbohydrates, aka sugar, into energy. But there's a couple ways in which this system can go wrong. With type 1 diabetes, your body suddenly and unexpectedly stops producing insulin, the hormone that turns sugar into energy. A type 1 diabetic like myself has to inject insulin every day in order to survive. Now with type 2 diabetes, your body still produces insulin, but your cells have trouble using it. Treatment can involve pills to increase your insulin sensitivity or potentially doing extra insulin shots. With both conditions, the level of sugar in your blood fluctuates much more wildly than it would normally. When it's too high, you face fatigue and more importantly are at risk of long-term organ and nerve damage. But if it goes too low, it's as if your body is running out of fuel and your brain can slowly shut down. Now both of these conditions have genetic drivers, but actually type 2 diabetes, the type that 90% of people living with diabetes have, has an even stronger genetic component, totally negating what I said before. Now, the conception that we all have, though, is that while type 1 diabetes strikes suddenly and you can't do anything about it, type 2 can get worse with poor diet and exercise. Did you notice anything missing from my explanation? That's right, that giant ice cream sundae that you ate this weekend will not give you diabetes. Now, if you ate that ice cream sundae every meal, every day, for a couple months, okay, you might be at higher risk of diabetes. But even then, that wouldn't determine it. The point I want to get across here is that a diet high in sugar can be a contributing factor to diabetes, but it is not the cause of diabetes. So now you have a better idea of what diabetes is. Why is it so hard to manage? Can't you just take this pill or take insulin and solve the problem? The truth is, is, that, this is that this system is extremely complex. According to Diatribe, a diabetes nonprofit, there are 22 factors that impact the level of sugar in your blood. Food and insulin are the obvious ones. But did you know that stress and even altitude can have an impact? Let me give you an example. When I was taking the GMAT exam, I had to pick my poison. I knew that the stress was going to cause my blood sugar levels to slowly climb and fatigue me. But if I took insulin to bring this down, I was at risk of going too low and my brain shutting down on me mid-exam. The truth is, is that your body is like NASA, using supercomputers and satellites to land a rocket on the moon every day to get your blood sugar levels just right. 
Now, someone with diabetes still has to land this rocket on the moon every day, but you're doing the math by hand and you're measuring the variables with a telescope. As you can imagine, things go wrong. A lot. And when I was recently on a hike with my friends, I suddenly realized that my blood sugar was at a dangerous low level. And I felt embarrassed when I had to ask them to stop and wait a second while I desperately tried to scarf down some candy to get my blood sugar levels to come back up so my brain could start functioning at its full level. And while this happened because my body failed me and because of many factors out of my control, I couldn't help but feel personally responsible. And this brings me to my last and most important point, why we need to change the conversation. According to Diatribe, 50% of individuals living with type, one di uh, type 2 diabetes and over 70% of individuals living with type 1 diabetes believe that there's stigma associated with their disease. That's right, the majority of the 1 in 11 people living with diabetes feel ashamed. We feel like we're a burden not only to ourselves, but to our friends, to our family. We feel embarrassed when someone questions our ability to play sports or to have cake on our birthday. As I mentioned, I hid my disease into my 20s. This means that I would do my insulin late or sometimes not do it at all. I would eat whatever my friends were eating because I didn't want to feel different. But the truth is that these actions were incredibly self-destructive. So now you may be asking, what changed? How am I able to get up on this stage in front of you and talk about diabetes? To be an advocate for the cause, to want to go into the diabetes industry after I leave the GSB. For that, I have to thank my former mentor, Tobias Wheelow. Tobias had two kids that, were type one that had type one diabetes, and he was my ally. He would come over to my cubicle at work and talk to me about the latest diabetes technology. If someone said something misinformed, he would make sure and speak up. Tobias helped pull me out from under the weight of my shame and empowered me to take ownership of my disease. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. Shame is the diabetes complication we need to talk about. And now you're armed with the knowledge of what it is, why it's so difficult to manage, and why we must change the conversation. But what exactly can you do? First, don't use diabetes as the punchline to your joke. Please don't hashtag diabetes when you splurge on that giant Slurpee at 7-Eleven. <laughs> it belittles a really complex and difficult condition. Secondly, if you're hosting a dinner party and someone there has diabetes, don't assume what we need. Ask. We all treat our condition a little differently and I, for one, would love to have some of that amazingly delicious cheesecake that you make. Now on that point, if I already have a bite of that delicious cheesecake in my mouth, I promise you I can be eating it. It's not going to kill me. You don't need to double check, but I appreciate it. <laughs> and finally, if you see something or hear something misinformed, say something. It can be really difficult for us to stand up for ourselves in front of a large group. You now know why diabetes is so complex and the factors that make it so difficult to manage. Let's work together to remove shame from the equation. <laughs>